I've been hearing about South Park Commons for years, so it's really great to finally be here. Um, and yeah, as Kara mentioned, I'm uh, in the like penultimate stages of writing a book, and I'm going to be uh, testing out some ideas on you guys, and I'll be really curious to hear what you think of them. Maybe some of your you know questions or objections will make their way into the final manuscript. It'll be very great. Uh, so yes, this talk is about a trait uh, called intellectual honesty. It's something I've been obsessed with for as long as I can remember. Um, basically, most of my career in one way or another has been thinking about or talking to people about or studying intellectual honesty. Um, and I think one reason that I'm so obsessed with it is that I feel like it's woefully underappreciated in the world in general. And so, you know those things where like you think something is really great or really important and you look around and the rest of the world like isn't paying attention to it and so you have this like drive to like take people by the lapels and like shake them and make them see what's so great or important about it. That's intellectual honesty for me. Um, and when I ask myself why is intellectual honesty so, why does it seem to be so underappreciated, um, I think there are two reasons. One, no one yet, to my, in my opinion, has really explained what it is and you know, how it works in a clear and compelling way, the way that we have for other traits like intelligence or grit. And then second, no one has yet made a strong case for why it's in your self-interest to cultivate or you know, develop intellectual honesty. At best, some people have lamented how, oh, wouldn't the world be a better place if more people were intellectually honest, um, which I think is true, but that alone doesn't really motivate individual people to try to learn about and develop a trait. Um, and I actually think there is a strong case to make for why it's in your own interest. So I've been writing this book to try to remedy both of those situations. Um, and in this talk, I'll just give you kind of a small slice of my argument. I'm going to leave a lot of questions unanswered just for brevity, but we can probably follow up on whatever you're curious about in the Q&A if you want. So intellectual honesty. First off, how is this different from regular honesty? Being honest simply requires you to avoid consciously lying. Um, for example, if you know that your company's profitability has been going down, but you tell people it's going up, you're not being honest. Intellectual honesty, by contrast, is not about what you tell other people. It's about how you form your views, um, your beliefs. It means trying to figure out what's actually true, as opposed to what's convenient or flattering or reassuring or validating. So let's say, for example, you examine all of your company's metrics, uh, revenue, number of new employees, profitability, web traffic, and they're all kind of dismal except for web traffic. And you then convince yourself that none of the other metrics really matter except for web traffic. Uh, you're not being dishonest when you tell people that your company is doing great, but you're not necessarily being intellectually honest um, in, in the way that I'm talking about. So I have this central metaphor for to like explain intellectual honesty in the book. Um, if you're a soldier on a battlefield, your job is to protect your side and to attack the enemy. But instead, what if you're the scout? In that case, as the scout, your goal is not to attack or defend. Your goal is to go out and get as accurate a map of the landscape as possible. And you may hope to learn that there's a bridge across the river at some conveniently located point, but regardless of what you hope is true, above all, you just want to know what's actually there. So I think of the soldier and the scout as metaphors for these two different modes that we have all built into our brains, these two different ways of thinking. Soldier mode, or as I sometimes say, soldier mindset, is a metaphor for what cognitive scientists call directionally motivated cognition. So you can see why I needed a catchier name for this. Uh, <laughs> it means your brain is approaching ideas as if they were soldiers on a battlefield. Some ideas are on your side and you want to defend them. And other ideas or other information are not on your side, they're threatening, and you want to shoot them down or avoid them, deflect them. So some examples of soldier mode, um, you spot a headline suggesting that some policy, political or economic policy you support isn't actually working or is not as great as it's cracked up to be. And even before you click the link, your brain immediately readies itself to find the flaws in the article. Two, you're in a meeting and you're irritating an overly smug coworker starts to expound on what he thinks the company should do. And even before he gets to the point, you're already itching to hate his idea. Three, you have a long-term goal, like eat healthier. But somehow every week you always have some logical rationale for why this particular week isn't a good time to start dieting. Like, well, I'm on vacation this week, I should really indulge. Or like, well, I'm working hard this week, I really should indulge. Um, 
to give a personal example, uh, as Kara mentioned, I used to work with this organization, Center for Applied Rationality. One thing that, like a, a main thing that we did was host these four day um, kind of educational workshops for 30 or 40 people. Um, and as we were running these workshops, I knew that it was really important to check in with participants, especially in the first couple days of the workshop, to find out, you know, are they having an okay time? Are they like confused or lost, or is there anything wrong? Because if you find out early, then you might be able to fix it in time for them to like leave with a good experience. Um, so even though I was kind of afraid of hearing bad news, uh, if a participant was unhappy, it was much better to find out sooner rather than later so you could fix it. So I would, in the evenings and in between classes, I would go around talk to people, um, ask them questions like, so how's everything going for you? Um, are you enjoying the workshop? And I was proud of myself for kind of proactively seeking out negative feedback until I noticed one day that as I was asking people these questions, like, are you enjoying the workshop? I was unconsciously nodding at them encouragingly <laughs> um, and smiling as if to say, the answer is yes, right? Uh, sometimes I would even hold two thumbs up, like, how's the workshop going? <laughs> um, and like, clearly, at least part of my mind wasn't on board with the project of learning the truth about how the workshop was going. It was just trying to ensure that I heard good news by like sneaking a finger on the scale, um, even at the expense of being able to improve the workshop. So the pattern in all these cases is the same. There's something that you want to believe because it's satisfying or comforting or convenient, and your brain finds a way to defend it. So I said soldier mode was a metaphor for directionally motivated cognition. Scout mode is my metaphor for what scientists call accuracy-motivated cognition. Um, trying to figure out what's true, regardless of what you hope or fear might be true. And this is basically what intellectual honesty is. So if you're in scout mode, you may hope that your current business strategy is succeeding. You may hope that you were not at fault in some screw up at work, or that you're making a good impression on your dates. Um, you may hate the Republicans or the Democrats and hope that they're proven wrong. But even stronger than your hopes is a motivation to figure out whatever the truth really is, uh, rather than deceive yourself into believing something good. So if you're in scout mode, you're going to be interested in evidence, even if it's not telling you what you want to hear. Um, you're going to be proactively testing your own assumptions. Um, if you find out that someone believes something that you completely disagree with, you're going to be trying to understand why they believe that, instead of just getting angry at them for believing that thing. Um, I think it's, it's interesting to to look at other ways that people have tried to talk about this concept in the past. So there's another metaphor that people sometimes use to talk about or that's like similar to mine, which is that of the lawyer versus the judge, right? So in a courtroom, the lawyer is arguing for one side. Um, he has to be technically honest, but he's definitely not supposed to be intellectually honest. He's supposed to be making the strongest case possible for his client's side and then you know, distracting from you know, points where they're weak or you know, downplaying uh, and by contrast, the judge in the courtroom, her role is to hear both sides, make the most unbiased decision possible, um, to notice when one side is alighting certain inconvenient details, um, to ask questions that will help her figure out the truth about what's happening. Intellectual honesty is kind of central to her job description. So I've, I've occasionally seen people use judge or like judge mindset as a metaphor to capture something similar to what I'm talking about here, um, or sometimes detective or scientist. And it's true that all of these metaphors capture something important about intellectual honesty. But there's a reason that I think scout mindset is the best concept. So I kind of want to make the case for this metaphor in particular. Um, it's importantly different because what it brings to the foreground is the usefulness of the truth, the usefulness of having an accurate map of the world. For the scout, the whole point of having that accurate map is so he can use it to navigate the world more successfully. The reason scouts want to know about their strengths and weaknesses or about where their current business strategy is likely to succeed or whether, um, whether they were in a, at fault in a fight with their partner and so on is so that they can make better decisions going forward. Um, and even if you can't predict how an accurate map of one particular topic is going to end up being useful, it tends to pay off indirectly in the long run. So for example, I have a friend I'll call Bob who had an unusual childhood. He was homeschooled in a family with strong supernatural beliefs. So they raised him to believe in things like astral projection, um, mind reading, energy healing. So Bob had grown up taking all, for granted all of these things as, as just part of reality. And then one day in his 20s, um, after you know, by that point having encountered doubters, um, he thought to himself, 
there's got to be some like conclusive evidence about whether or not this stuff is real. I've just been like trusting my family, but like I keep getting into these arguments, and I don't really know what to tell people. So I'm going to actually investigate this for myself. Um, so he started researching. Well, he started with studies of out-of-body experiences, um, and he had he had heard there were plenty of examples of out-of-body experiences where people, um, you know, were able to like report accurately what was on the top shelf of a bookcase or what was in another room, which they couldn't have done if they weren't actually projecting into that other space. So he went looking for those studies, and like one by one, he discovered that they, they didn't actually show the thing that he thought they showed, or they were all kind of hearsay, and he couldn't actually find the original story, which was frustrating. So that was kind of the first thread that he pulled, um, and more and more of the stuff started to unravel. Um, and over the course of about a year, he began to disbelieve in all of the supernatural phenomena that he had taken for granted growing up. Now, Bob had not been seeking any benefit other than just the satisfaction of knowing what was actually true. But nevertheless, I, th I think his investigation did end up benefiting him. For one thing, he now spends less time attempting paranormal interventions um, and more time on things that have a better chance of working. But there's a higher order benefit too. Having investigated one pillar of non-scientific or anti-scientific claims and seeing it kind of crumble under scrutiny, Bob became a little bit more skeptical of other claims that contradicted established science. Which is not to say that all claims that contradict the current scientific consensus are wrong, but there's like some appropriate amount of skepticism to apply to a claim that goes against like standard science, and it's more than Bob had originally been applying. So what that means is that Bob is now a little bit better equipped to get the right answer in other domains like health or psychology. Um, he's less likely to waste his time on a medical therapy that doesn't work um, or fall for a scam. That's a real practical benefit to Bob having a more accurate map, even though Bob never set out thinking, I'm going to investigate paranormal claims because I you know, want to improve my health in the long run. So there's not a lot of research on what I call scout mode or scout mindset yet. Uh, most research in this area uh, is focused on demonstrating the existence of soldier mode, focusing on um, showing that we're subject to ideological biases, um, that we resist changing our minds, etc. cetera. Um, but there are some exceptions. So, for example, you might have heard of a recent book called Super Forecasting. Uh, it's by a political scientist named Phil Tetlock. And he spent about 20 years tracking experts' uh, ability to forecast global events, like elections or wars or social unrest. Um, and on the whole, the outcome was disappointing. Even so-called experts, like people who were professional pundits or academics studying politics or economics, were barely better at predicting world events than random chance. As Tetlock put it, uh, the average expert at predicting world events was, quote, roughly as accurate as a dart-throwing chimpanzee. Um, and the problem, the reason that they were so inaccurate was a combination of factors. They were overconfident. Um, they gave knee-jerk quick answers without like, a lot of you know, second-guessing themselves um, or double-checking things. They had simplistic theories about the world. And crucially, they wouldn't admit when they had been wrong in the past. So even when an expert's prediction had been clearly disproven, um, like they thought an election would turn out one way and it turned out another way, um, they always had an ex post facto reason why they weren't really wrong. Like, well, I would have been right about the election if it hadn't been for this scandal or whatever. And so they never actually learned from their mistakes. But there was a small subset of amateurs um, in Tetlock's sample who actually had real forecasting skill. So much so that they beat CIA analysts um, and professors year after year. Um, setting records at forecasting ability, um, predicting global, global events like will al-Assad remain the president of Syria through 2012. Tetlock dubbed them the super forecasters. So what were they doing right? Well, they were smart, for sure, um, but so was their competition. You don't get to be a CIA analyst or a professor without being smart. Um, and it wasn't that they knew more than other people either. They were amateurs. They were pharmacists. They were factory workers. Um, and they had no special background in topics like Syrian politics, when they wanted to research a topic before making a forecast, they used Google to learn about it. So what made Tetlock's super forecasters unique was that they were in scout mode. They were happy to acknowledge when they had been wrong about a previous forecast. Um, and they sort of updated their models of what was happening or how to make good forecasts over time. They had no particular emotional attachments to one ideology over another. Um, so they sought out news sources from lots of different perspectives. In short, their motivation to form an accurate picture of reality, at least in this domain, was stronger than their motivation to stick to their guns or defend their past beliefs. Here's a very different kind of domain, disaster survival. 
researchers who have studied cases of people who get lost in the wilderness um, while hiking or um, stranded after a plane crash or a shipwreck will tell you that most people don't make it. Um, partly that's due to bad luck, but it's also due to the way that 90% of people react in an emergency. Um, they freeze up, they panic, they go into denial, um, they choose to believe that they will be rescued, they bargain with fate or with God. There's a great book called Deep Survival, Who Lives, Who Dies, and Why. Um, and the author, Lawrence Gonzalez, studies hundreds of cases of people who either did or didn't survive and what we know about their stories. Um, and he says, quote, many victims have perished waiting for God to help them out instead of recognizing that whether or not you believe in a God, you must help yourself. Or they perish because they never prepared for disaster in the first place, following kind of a, if I don't think about it, it won't happen heuristic. So they don't bring along proper equipment or extra water uh, in case of a shipwreck because they don't want to think about the possibility of a shipwreck. Um, they don't educate themselves about the hazards of the area where they're hiking. But, so that's like 90% of people, but then there are the exceptions. Uh, among the 10% who do survive, there's a commonality. They're the ones who think consciously about potential ways that they could you know, end up stranded. Uh, they take precautions in advance. They quickly accept that rescuers might not find them and that they might be in for a long struggle to survive. Um, they have an accurate picture of their abilities. They don't overestimate themselves, but they also don't underestimate themselves. Uh, so Gonzalez sums up this commonality between the survivors by saying the first, first rule of survival is face reality. So all of this so far raises the question, why isn't scout mode or scout mindset our default? Like if scout mindset is so great, why do we naturally tend to gravitate towards soldier mindset instead? Um, and what can we learn from the exceptions to that rule? The answer here comes down to the fact that our brains aren't optimized for reaching the truth. This uh, was a big revelation to me when I <laughs> learned it. It may not feel so groundbreaking to you, um, but it had always seemed to me, it just sort of, I naturally assumed that like, our ability to reason about the world must be there in order to help us figure out the world. <laughs> Why else would it have evolved? Um, but our brains are actually, you know, if you, you just think about what drives evolution, our brains are optimized for surviving and passing on our genes. And sometimes that involves having accurate beliefs, um, like having accurate beliefs about how to build a shelter or how to um, catch your prey or escape predators. But in other cases, our ancestors may just have been better off believing false things. Um, increasingly, cognitive scientists think that our tendency to defend some ideas and reject other ideas, almost independent of the evidence, evolved because in many cases it was strategically useful. So for example, believing that everything is going great even when it's not can boost your morale. Um, psychologists call this a psychological immune system. Believing that you have various positive qualities even when you don't, like believing that you're you know, brave and trustworthy and virtuous and competent um, can be a useful way to impress or persuade other people, right? Uh, if you can act like you're a good leader or a good mate, um, even if you're not, um, and you really believe that, you're going to be more persuasive to other people in your tribe, um, even if it's not true. Those are just a couple of the ways in which it seems like believing false things could have been adaptive. Now, my position is that even though soldier mode seems to have been useful for our ancestors, it's actually net harmful for us now in the modern world. Um, and that we would be better off if we could switch away from soldier mode and into scout mode more often. So here's one reason that I think this. Your genes are short-sighted. You're already familiar with this phenomenon in other contexts. For example, when you're thinking about what you'd prefer to do tomorrow night and you're choosing between staying in and watching Netflix or going to the gym, you often decide, I'll go to the gym. You know, Netflix is great, but like, the gym's the healthier choice. I'll feel better about myself afterwards. But then when the choice is tonight, Netflix or the gym tonight, well, the gym can wait another day. <laughs> so there's just this interesting inconsistency in our preferences depending on how close we are to the choice. Um, and the inconsistency is unbalanced in a way that uh, prioritizes immediate rewards over, over immediate costs and delayed rewards. The technical term for this, uh, instead of short-sightedness, is hyperbolic discounting. Um, we don't know for sure why humans evolved this way, the most common theory is that it's a response to the inherent uncertainty of our ancestors' lives. You know, when you could, a week from now, get eaten by a predator or die from an untreated infection, 
maybe it really was rational to eat dessert first and just you know consume all the resources you could instead of planning for the long term. Um, and since our brains evolved in that world, it's hard for us now to motivate ourselves to do things that incur a short-term cost in exchange for a long-term benefit. Um, we don't know. That's you know a plausible story. Um, but the existence of the phenomenon is pretty clear. And I think soldier mode fits the same pattern of short-term uh, benefits in exchange for longer-term bigger costs. So for example, if you've ever been running late um, and you have to call your friend or text your friend to say, sorry, I'm running late. I'll be there in blank minutes. You might notice that your brain really wants to fill in that blank with an optimistic number. Because um, you just, like, you know you'll, your friend will be like a little irritated if you say 25 minutes. So you kind of optimistically say 10 minutes, really like believe you can make it in 10. But of course, this is a very short-term benefit. Um, when you end up being 25 minutes late, your friend will be more annoyed than if you had just said 25 minutes up front. So you're just trading off a happy friend now for an even unhappier friend a little bit later. To take a more consequential example, um, a pair of cognitive scientists in 2001 followed a group of college students from freshman year to graduation. Um, and some of the students were what they dubbed self-enhancers, so people who had an unrealistically high uh, picture of their academic abilities relative to objective measures like their GPA or their SAT scores. Um, and relative to other students, the self-enhancers were more likely to predict great success for themselves. Um, they were more likely to take credit for whatever successes they had had as being due to skill and then uh, dismiss their failures as bad luck. And they reaped short-term benefits. The self-enhancers had higher self-esteem, reported higher well-being uh, than other students at first. But over the course of their college career, their academic performance just kept failing to live up to their positive self-image. And their well-being and self-esteem declined uh, much more over the course of their college career than that of the people who hadn't started out self-enhancing. Um, and they did, like, if you have the ability to self-deceive in ways that sort of buffer your morale in the short term, you can actually use that in cases where you're failing at the thing you thought you were good at. Um, and the self-enhancers did. They, they sort of detached from their academic goals. So like over the course of the four years, they increasingly said, you know what, school isn't actually that important to me. Um, so I'm sure they like, were able to preserve some amount of well-being through that too. But I think there's just like a limit to how much the, you know, the grapes were sour anyway strategy can actually make you feel happy and fulfilled over the long run. Um, I have several other reasons to suspect that we would be better off with less soldier mindset than our genes gave us. But I'm going to stop there for now. Um, and we can talk about more in Q&A if you want. Because uh, I want to talk about one more big question before I close. So scout mindset is a matter of degree. Um, it varies within a given person depending on the day or depending on the context. So a banker, for example, might have scout mindset you know, at work. Uh, like He might be very open to learning that his trading strategy has a mistake in it. Um, but at the same time, he might not be nearly as open to hearing about his mistakes in the context of his personal relationships, just for example. So the question is, what determines which mode we're in? Why are we sometimes scouts and sometimes soldiers? My answer is that it all comes down to incentives. So I'm sure you're already familiar with the power of incentives in shaping people's behavior in general. Um, if you want to increase your sales, you can offer your salespeople a big commission. Um, they'll try harder to make more sales. In general, the greater the payoff people get from doing something, um, the more they'll be willing to do it. And incentives don't have to be purely material. You can incentivize people with respect or um, attention. That's why people strive for heroism in war or um, for fame as an actor. It's mostly not the money. So you know about how incentives work in general. The new piece that I'm adding here is that incentives don't just shape how you behave. They shape what you believe um, and how you think. So you might have heard the saying from uh, journalist Upton Sinclair, quote, it is difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends on him not understanding it. That's a case of incentives putting people in soldier mode. Um, to take a concrete example, let's say you're a scientist being funded by a pharmaceutical company. You have a strong incentive to believe um, and to conclude in your research that their drugs are effective and safe. Um, and indeed, papers whose authors were employed by drug companies are 22 times less likely to find anything negative uh, about the drug compared to independent scientists. And I'm sure the vast majority of the scientists aren't consciously lying. They're not consciously committing fraud. It's just 
there's a bunch of choices that you have to make in designing a study um, about which hypotheses to test, um, you know, which outliers, which data to exclude from your analysis, when to you know, rerun an analysis to see if it still holds up. Um, and in the course of making all those choices, you have a lot of freedom, even unconscious freedom, to, to fish for the conclusion that you want or avoid the conclusion that you don't. So a corollary of this is that if you change people's incentives, the level, their level of intellectual honesty will change as well. If the payoff for being accurate is big enough, it can even outweigh existing incentives that people have to self-deceive. For example, one study asked people questions that were factual but politically charged. So like, has unemployment increased or decreased since Obama took office? And unsurprisingly, people's answers were strongly partisan. Republicans gave answers that were flattering to Republicans. Democrats gave answers that were flattering to Democrats. But then, the experimenters offered participants a monetary incentive to be accurate. For each correct response, they would get a ticket, a raffle ticket, uh, to win a $200 Amazon gift card. Lo and behold, it turned out people actually knew the answers. Uh, incorrect responses went down by 50%. This is the same principle behind the idea that a tax, or sorry, a bet is a tax on bullshit, which you might have heard before. Uh, you can see this principle in action when often someone will make like a confident claim, like there's no way the Democrats could lose, or there's no way this ideal, ideal will work. Um, and then if you offer to bet with them, like offering the, basically inviting them to put their money where their mouth is, suddenly they shift back towards scout mode and realize, ah, maybe I'm not as confident in this claim as I thought I was. That's like the satisfying resolution. The unsatisfying resolution is when they still uh, you know, double down but still refuse to bet for you for unspecified reasons. It's maddening. Um, <laughs> but you can, you can notice this in yourself. Like if you, you know, say something that seems true to you in the moment, and then someone asks, like, would you bet with me you know, at even odds about that? Or, or you can even ask yourself, like, would I be willing to wager money you know, on this? Often you'll notice that your level of confidence shifts, or you like, suddenly realize, like, ah, there are actually a bunch of ways that could like, fail to happen. And I'm like, I wouldn't actually wager a lot of money on that. Um, so the incentives that I've been discussing so far are all external incentives. They're money or um, prestige or your job or social approval. But these aren't the only kinds of incentives that affect us. There are also internal incentives, um, emotional rewards or punishments doled out by your own brain. Enjoyment, satisfaction, pride, frustration, boredom. Uh, these are all powerful incentives that shape our behavior and our thinking just as much as money or social approval do. You know, the reason that you devote hours to that video game isn't because you're going to get paid a lot of money or you know, get the adulation of fans online, unless you're like, a popular streamer. Uh, it's because you find the experience intrinsically enjoyable, and you know that you'll feel a lot of satisfaction when you finally beat it. So that also means that one of the most important determinants of whether you're more in soldier or scout mode is, are you internally incentivized to face reality? And that can break down in a lot of ways. Um, are you able to contemplate the possibility of failure calmly, or does the mere thought terrify you and send you into like a despair spiral? Do you feel guilty when you disagree with your political or ideological tribes or not? One example of an internal incentive that has been studied is curiosity. How much enjoyment do you get just out of understanding how things work? There's a striking study that came out uh, just last year by a Yale professor named Dan Kahan that shows how ideological biases polarize people's views of scientific issues, like climate change. Um, Republicans are more skeptical of those dangers, Democrats are less skeptical, and both sides are uninterested in reading evidence to the contrary. That, of course, is not the striking part. <laughs> that is bog standard. But Kahan discovered two twists on the standard story. The first twist was that scientific literacy, or as he called it, scientific intelligence, made the political polarization on these issues worse. You might have thought that the more people knew about science, the more they would gradually converge on a shared view of some scientific issue. But instead, as people's levels of intelligence or scientific intelligence went up, Democrats' belief in climate change went way up, and Republicans actually went down. So if you look at just the top percentile of scientific intelligence, Democrats' agreement with the reality of climate change was almost 100%, and Republicans was less than 20%. So Kahan's explanation for this, which I find plausible, is that the more intelligent and sophisticated of a reasoner you are, the more cleverly you can make a case for whatever you want, which is a sobering finding, especially if you had 
hopes that you know better scientific education uh, or information would be the cure for our politicized discourse. So that's the first twist. But the twist on the twist is that while scientific intelligence made polarization worse, scientific curiosity made it better. So on the left, you can see the graph of Democrat and Republican belief in climate change as scientific intelligence goes up. It gets way more polarized, as you can see. But on the right is the same graph, but for curiosity, not intelligence. As curiosity went up, Democrats and Republicans' views on climate change actually converged slightly, but they converged. Um, agreement with climate change was higher among the most curious subjects than the least curious, even among Republicans. So curiosity seems to at least partially inoculate us from politically motivated reasoning. Now you remember how a few minutes ago we were talking about how uh, you can change people's degree of scout mindset or intellectual honesty by changing their external incentives, like by offering them money um, for getting the right answer. Well, the same is true for internal incentives. If you make it less emotionally threatening or more rewarding for someone to accept the truth, you increase their motivation to do so. One way to do that, which has probably been studied the most, is a technique somewhat embarrassingly called self-affirmation. Uh, the name makes it sound cheesy, like you're staring into a mirror and saying, you know, gosh darn it, people like me and I'm awesome. Um, but it just, in this context, it just means reminding yourself of something about your life or yourself that you're happy about, that you feel good about. Um, and the logic of the researchers who decided to, um, to test this out was that the more secure you feel, the less threatening it is to consider either bad news or like ideologically challenging arguments. And so far, based on our current study, this seems to work. Um, just to give you a couple examples, in one study, college students who did a self-affirmation before watching a video about HIV were significantly more likely to agree that they personally were at risk for HIV instead of saying that it was a problem for other people and not for them. Um, even more impressive, uh, and I almost don't buy this result because it's so dramatic, 50% of the people who did a self-affirmation chose to purchase condoms after watching the video on HIV, compared to only 25% of the people who didn't do a self-affirmation. More research is needed. I thought that was interesting. Um, I just raised a, an eyebrow. Uh, another example, self-affirmation seems to make people more receptive to information that threatens their political views. So Republicans who do a self-affirmation are significantly more likely to correctly answer questions about global warming. And Democrats who do a self-affirmation are significantly more likely to give the correct answer um, to questions about how the surge, the escalation of troops in Iraq reduced fatalities. Basically, the self-affirmation makes people feel less need to defend their pre-existing position because they feel like, well, even if this thing turns out to be true, it's okay because I feel good about myself anyway. That's the theory. So this model, in which people's degree of scout mindset is a function of their incentives, I think helps explain a lot of apparent mysteries. For one, it explains why teaching kids critical thinking in school tends not to work. We can lecture kids about logical fallacies or about the importance of fact-checking claims you see on the internet, of uh, considering alternative hypotheses, and so on, until we're blue in the face. But it barely changes their degree of motivated reasoning and bias. And I think that's because while we may have increased their ability to be accurate, we haven't increased their incentive to be accurate. If there's no payoff from getting the right answer, either material payoff, social payoff, or emotional, why should they bother to expend the effort to do so? And on the flip side, they still face the same incentives to reach particular conclusions, like the incentive to signal loyalty to their tribe, um, to look strong, to look consistent with what they said in the past, then they're going to continue to respond to those same incentives, no matter how much knowledge we give them about the correct way to reason. So, both external and internal incentives can shift your mindset, make you more inclined to try to view things accurately. Um, as an individual, though, it's often hard to change your external incentives, right? If your boss doesn't reward accuracy or, you know, worse, like, punishes you or looks down on you for acknowledging potential flaws in a plan or acknowledging, you know, less than 100% confidence, um, that's not something you can easily change. Uh, you can always try to choose a job you know, or a, a workplace or a social circle where the people around you actually reward intellectual honesty um, and like respect you more when you add nuance or change your mind. Um, that's something I've tried to do, but it's just not the most practical or easy fix for most people. 
uh, I think changing external incentives also makes most sense as kind of a top-down strategy. Like if you're putting together a team or founding a company um, or even like trying to you know, cultivate social community among your friends, um, this is the kind of thing that you can like try to build into the culture from the beginning. But speaking as an individual, thinking like, given the world that I live in, given the environment that I'm subject to, how do I increase my level of intellectual honesty? Um, external incentives aren't the most malleable. So I think it's most promising to talk about ways to shift our internal incentives. How do you become someone who can consider inconvenient possibilities without flinching? How do you make it actually rewarding to change your mind instead of uncomfortable? Um, how do you train yourself to be curious in arguments instead of irritated? That's the next step. Um, but I'm going to close there and see what you think of my model so far. Um, does it make sense? Do you buy my arguments about scout mindset um, and why it's important and the way incentives affect us? So that's it. Thank you. Um, I do buy your arguments about scout awesome. mindset. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> but I wanted to add a little flavor and also some questions around it. One is that I'm sure you've heard this. Um, this sounds like the battle between the ego and your higher self. Uh, where the ego is the part that is concerned with survival and creates stories, like nar narratives, uh, as yeah, opposed to the one that there. wants to be the unstoried self and see the situation as it is. So um, given that context, I was just curious, um, two things. One is, uh, do you support like mindfulness education uh, as part mm. of the solution towards building more and more scout mindset, since it seems to be at least anecdotally correlated with being able to see things as they are? Right, whether it's meditation or mindfulness, that's one. The other, though, kind of like um, thing that's not settled in my mind after hearing you talk is that um, it sort of depends on an assumption that there is something known as absolute truth. And when you come down to things like moral values or like you know deeply held beliefs about how life should be run, mm -hmm. uh, how do you? incentivize people to think about the greater good, which is, I think, what intellectual honesty. Uh, I'm, l I'm lump lumping too many things here. <laughs> it basically seems like there are no clear incentives for asking people to change their views um, and beliefs that are maybe very cultural or morally driven, as opposed to things that money could help buy. <laughs> Right. Even, even if you look at the diversity initiatives out there, people talk about it, label, put on the hashtag diversity, but aren't necessarily incentivized at a deeper level to live that behavior. That's kind of what I'm after at and how you can explore that question. Kind of right. throwing a lot out there. So quick and easy question. Um, <laughs> well, uh, with respect to mindfulness, uh, I thought a lot about putting that in my book um, because I, I agree that there's um, both like a convincing argument for why that would be an important part of um, you know, noticing when you're not in scout mindset and shifting towards it. Um, and also just anecdotally, the people who I see who are especially good at this, uh, at scout mindset, are also disproportionately more mindful or have like spent time on mindfulness or just like seem to have kind of a natural like tendency to notice like, Oh, I notice that I'm like feeling unsettled about this, or like oh, I notice that I'm like feeling defensive or something, and they're just like better at that than the average person. Um, I didn't end up putting it in my book because I I don't know how to teach it, um, and I don't I I don't know I I might be a little bit better at it than average, but I don't think I'm a lot better at it than average. Um, so I was I was just looking for other I have a whole section on like how to do introspection right, how like when you notice. Or, or if you ask yourself, like, am I doing this for the right reasons or am I doing it for selfish reasons? Or if you ask yourself, like, am I rationalizing and, like, this, you know, would actually be a fine week to diet, but I, like, just don't feel like it and so I'm coming up with an excuse or is it, like, actually a real, you know, do I have a good reason? Um, those kinds of questions are really hard to introspect about because, you know, you ask yourself the question and your brain just, like, tells you the, you know, correct answer. So it's, it's kind of hard to get out of that loop. Um, but I do think that there are ways to introspect that are more likely to cause you to notice, um, oh, that, uh, that like, judgment that my brain produced was not coming from the place I thought it was coming from. Um, I, I won't go into that whole thing now. I just, uh, short answer is like mindfulness is probably useful. Um, I don't know how to teach it, so I focus on introspection instead.
Um, your other question about absolute truth. So, so I think for a lot of questions, worrying about absolute truth with a capital T is just kind of like in practice beside the point. Like, you know, we can sit down and have a debate about like, is there such a thing as absolute truth? But then when we like leave the conversation, we still like have beliefs about whether, you know, it's safe to walk out into the street or whether like what's the probability that eating the sandwich is going to kill us or um, we are like like even if someone explicitly doubts the existence of truth and thinks everything is relative if you actually look at the way they behave and make choices they clearly do think some things are more likely to be true than other things um, and I think for most questions it can just cash out in practical terms like what would you be willing to bet on um, instead of like can you prove from first principles that one answer is true and the other is not? Um, but then you mentioned uh, like moral beliefs. And I think, I think the way I would describe the purpose of intellectual honesty in that domain is not so much about what is the like true moral conclusion, but instead, what is the conclusion that you would come to if you didn't have other selfish motivations or other, you know, emotional motivations or absolutely, yeah. So, and you know, you can see people make that distinction sometimes. Like you can see people, uh, I don't know, like I have a friend who became vegan uh, in his 20s and in retrospect he thinks that like his rejection of arguments for veganism, you know, because he'd heard the arguments like 10 years earlier and like rejected them. And there was sort of this gradual transitional period where he started to feel like, ah, I think these are just, ex I, I think my rejections of these arguments are just kind of excuses. Like I don't, it just feels like I'm rationalizing. It feels like if I, you know, if this were like something that I didn't personally like really want to eat, I would find the arguments compelling. Um, so he like did gradually come to believe that his like true view on vegetarianism was like, yes, this is morally better. Um, now, is that like objectively correct? That's a very tough philosophical question to answer. But um, but the question of like, what would his sort of uncorrupted view be, uncorrupted by other interests? I think that's like more often has an answer. I'll add one more thing, which is that you are kind of creeping into mindfulness territory anyway, <laughs> because the self-affirmation exercise seems to be nothing but an, an as you put it already yourself, seems to be nothing but an exercise towards greater equanimity, which is what you need. It might need. well be. I'm definitely yeah. not an expert anyway. on mindfulness. No, I, I just love it. And I feel like I'm seeing all of these connections. And I assume it'll come up in your work at some point. I, I wouldn't bet against it. Thanks for the talk. Um, a lot of us here are entrepreneurs, startup mm -hmm. founders. And uh, to start a company, you kind of have, have this like irrational faith, believing your vision, your idea, being contrarian, having contrarian bets. A lot, at the same time, we want to be very rational in terms of the execution, right? Like mm -hmm. running Facebook ads, what works, what doesn't work, and so on, right? So if you build a company, can you have those two seemingly inconsistent idea? How do you build a culture where you have like, people have to believe in this kind of, you know, irrational, vision but still act rationally or or you think like it's you know you have to be one or the other like kind of how, how do you kind of recognize reconcile those two and and create a high performing team you know so I, I i know that there seems to be a tension i don't think there is as much inherent tension there as people often think um by which i mean i i think it's completely possible in that i've like seen people do this um i think it's completely possible to have like pretty well calibrated beliefs in the sense of like, I think there's maybe you know a 10% chance that I'll like achieve something I would call success in five years, or like I think there's you know, it's like more likely than not that we're gonna that like our current strategy is wrong, um, and yet at the same time just have the this kind of have this sort of emotional like enthusiasm, boldness, like willingness to go out and try things without, you know, constantly second-guessing themselves. Um, I don't actually think that, that second thing, the like, 
enthusiasm and boldness and bravery and so on is actually requires you to believe 100% that everything you're doing is definitely going to work. Um, I know some people like find it easier to do those two things at once, and other people seem to like if they allow themselves to think that they might fail, then that will like send them into a you know it'll demoralize them and like make them not able to do the like enthusiastic charge forward thing. Um, but in my opinion, the right intervention like given those conditions, the right intervention is not to say like, okay, I'll like, like try to deceive myself. It is instead to figure out how, how to like avoid getting demoralized by facing you know, the fact that you might not succeed or that you probably won't succeed this time or something like that. That's the intervention I would propose. How do you do that? <laughs> um, so I have this concept that I, in the book, currently call cushion, um, creating cushion. Um, and it's, so it's, the term sort of comes from having financial cushion, um, where like, you know, if you have enough money in your bank account, uh, you, you can kind of take some like small to medium sized risks. You can like quit your job or move to another city to look for work um, without worrying that like, you know, the next bout of bad luck is gonna ruin you. Um, and so it allows you to like make investments in yourself that will actually, you know, bootstrap you in the long run to a higher level of financial security, um, which you can't really do if you don't have much liquidity. So that was, that's the origin of the term cushion. And what I'm talking about here is not financial cushion, but instead a kind of cushion of morale. Um, it's sort of the thing that self-affirmation was uh, designed to create temporarily, which is the sense that like, well, I have preferences about what the truth is. Like I would prefer it to be the case that like, the Democrats are right, or I'd prefer it to be the case that um, you know, I'm not sick or something. But like, whatever the answer turns out to be, I'll be OK. Um, and this is the thing that well, I see. What if you won't? Look at the disaster scenario. Um, if it doesn't turn out OK, like you are going to die. Well, every now and then, there is you know, the like, worst plausible case scenario is actually like you die, or like everyone dies. <laughs> I think. I think in most cases, it's not that. In most cases, it's like, well, you know, if it is, like, if you're thinking about whether or not you have to fire a certain person, um, and you, like, really don't want it to be the case that you have to fire them, um, you can still get to the point where you're like, well, worst case scenario, if I have to fire them, like, here's what I would do. Like, here's what I would say to them. Like, it would be, like, unpleasant for this period of time, and then, like, I would get over it, and they would probably find another job, and, like, you don't want to lie to yourself, but, like, most of the time, it actually is okay. Um, in the small percentage of the time when like the worst plausible case scenario is you know death, I think there's still ways to be okay with that. Like I think there's still ways, and I'm not you know saying that's easy or that I'm perfect at it or anything, but I've definitely seen people uh, like just stare into the worst case scenario and be like, okay, well that's part of the dice roll I'm doing, and like I feel okay about this bet that I'm yeah, taking. And, I want to like, press just a little on that because yeah. it. That was one of your examples early in the talk, the, that in fact the people that survive, according to this book, are the ones that, that you cited, are the ones that face the reality that yeah. nobody's going to come to rescue. Um, or that no one, you know, it's Yeah, probably no one's going to come to yeah. rescue you, right? Um, and it seems like that means recognizing that the worst case is you die, you starve here, yeah. or whatever. And, um, and so this, this, this concept of cushion, it, it sounds like it's, it seems like it can't quite be convincing yourself that you'll be okay if it well, fails. And maybe okay it's that is, in the case where that's true, but it's but a, it's a weird. It's that you're somehow behaving as if you feel like feel now as if it'll be. It's okay. like accepting the possible world that you might be in, um, n not like trying to convince yourself that nothing bad will happen, but just being like, this is a possible thing that might happen. I like accept that, and like can move on, and act knowing that basically. Um, and I think there are different ways to, to create cushion. Um, one of them is just like, just think about the terrible thing that might happen and like come to terms with it before you, uh, before you try to think about how likely it is to happen or, or what you could do to or should do to avoid it. I think those questions are very hard to think about objectively if you haven't yet gotten to the point where you're like, okay, I can accept that this is a possibility. Um, until, you're, until you hit that point, I think your brain just sort of flinches away from it and will find reasons to rationalize why it doesn't need uh, planning for. 
Um, so one approach to creating cushion is just think about the outcome, just think about what it would be like, you get a little comfortable with it. Um, there are other, other approaches. One other approach is create a plan. Like, uh, you know, if I do have, if I do lose my job or if I do like decide that I made a huge mistake and should never have like, you know, left grad school or whatever the thing is that you're worried about, like what would I do? Just concretely, what are the steps that I would take if this turned out to be true? Um, like how would I, what's the wording of the email I would send to my parents <laughs> telling them that I'm like, you know, going back to grad school or like how would I, strategizing for like that awkward conversation that you have to have with someone you have to fire or something like that. So, uh, so planning can create cushion. And often it's not like mind-blowing things. It's like, yes, of course, I would say these things or like, oh yes, of course, I would, you know, take these steps to look for another job. But somehow just like having the plan can make it much easier to think about this possibility. Um, other approaches, sometimes you can like find a bright side. Like, uh, I know <laughs> this is a weird example to bring up because Elon Musk right now is not like a paragon of objectiveness and rationality. <laughs> but, um, but I was reading some old interviews with him where uh, uh, he was being asked like, so, so he said on multiple occasions that the probability he put on um, both Tesla and SpaceX succeeding as companies was like 10% for each of them. Um, and, and so the, in both interviews, the interviewer was like, well, how did you, like, why didn't that demotivate you? How were you able to, like, work so hard on the companies despite what you felt to be low odds? And he said, well, you just have to kind of, I think he called it fatalism, but it's what I would call cushion. He's like, you just have to sort of accept the odds and accept that you'll probably fail. And then, you know, think about, like, what's the good thing that would come out of it anyway? Like, in the case of Tesla, the thing he said, at least in the interview, was my feeling was even if we failed, we would like have changed the conversation about electric cars, and that's kind of exciting. Um, or in the case of SpaceX, uh, I forget what his thing was with SpaceX. He had something where he was like, "Well, even if we failed, I would still be able to feel good about this thing or something." Um, so obviously, like he still had preferences about whether he would succeed or fail, but he didn't feel like the failure situation was so intolerable that he couldn't even think about it or acknowledge it as a possibility. So I've gone on long enough, but there's a few ways that I think you can create that feeling of acceptance of the possible worlds. Um, yeah. I'm not like that skeptical, but I'm just curious to hear your other points on why you think uh, scout mindset is better than soldier mindset, because I think it's like super interesting, um, like as you mentioned, that it seems like this soldier mindset was useful in yeah. our past, and like how do we know that it's not still useful now? Like for an ex as an totally. example, um, like Elon Musk, for example, right? Like it might be better for someone in his scenario to think that there's actually a 51% chance of succeeding, even if it's actually 10%. Mm -hmm. And he'll still have like the same fatalism, i.e., oh, in the 49% chance that I fail, I still have these good things come out of it. But he just, he just ends up like maybe net happier, even though he's like deceiving himself, right? Uh, I'm not saying that that's like the perfect example, but I'm just like curious to hear more. It's a common this. argument people make in earnest, not just to play devil's advocate. Um, so I've thought about it a lot. Uh, there's, two, there's two different ways to approach your question. One is like, just what do you think about the common view that overestimating your odds of success makes you like happier and you know achieve more? And the other is like the evolutionary question of why should we think that evolution that like the thing that was useful in the past is no longer useful is that's like shouldn't be your default hypothesis. Um, so starting with the second one first, um, there are a number of reasons. Uh, one reason is just that. I think we have a lot more opportunities now than our ancestors did to just change the game board that we're playing on. Like, so in the past, uh, whatever the positive traits were that we wanted to signal to other people, like you know our strength or our uh, fertility or our loyalty or something like that, uh, they were like relatively uh, sort of immutable. Um, and so you know if you have Thinking strategically, if there's some trait that you can't really change, um, you might as well just like try to, to deceive yourself into believing you have more of it in order to convince other people you have more. Um, but that like self-deception gets in the way of actually changing things. So if you can change things, um, like if you can uh, go to Toastmasters and like become better at public speaking, or like build up your social skills in another way, or 
like pick a career where you're like better positioned to succeed than the career you're currently in or like there are all these ways you can actually change your odds of success instead of just like operating on through persuasion and uh, and self-deception and I think we have far more of those opportunities in the modern world than we did in the ancestral environment it seems to me uh, this is just you know, me reasoning about it uh, and so yeah the basic point is anytime you have like greater opportunity to actually change your situation, it's better to have an accurate map. And anytime you don't have ability to do that, you might as well uh, uh, self-deceive. Um, I'm just trying to decide. I have so many arguments in my head, I don't know which one to pick. Um, uh, I'll say one last thing about the evolutionary question, which is that another way that our world today is different from the ancestral environment is that I think social approval is just less critical now than it was in the past. So like, if you're in a small tribe and the tribe's people decide you're like, not loyal or like, not cool or a liability or something, that's, I mean, that's devastating to your, to your life and to your chance of passing on your genes. And so it makes sense to be very risk averse about not doing anything that could cause you to like, look foolish or alienate people. Um, but in the modern world, that, that instinct often causes us to like, be unnecessarily risk averse, like to be terrified of making a fool of ourselves in front of a stranger who we're never gonna see again, um, to like risk rejection at a bar or something like that. Um, like feels like a life or death thing, even though we know intellectually it's not. Um, and I think a lot of the benefits that self-deception serves in the like social signaling sense um, are benefits in the sense of like making us look good to other people. Um, but I just think that's like a less crucial thing now than it used to be. Um, and then the last thing I'll say about uh, like odds of success um, is that it's not like it's not clear to me why believing that you're fifty-one percent likely to succeed instead of like ten percent likely to succeed. Like you still there's all these decisions you have to make. There's decisions you have to make about like how long to pursue a strategy before giving up. There's decisions you have to make about how much of your resources to invest in something. Um, there's decisions just about like which strategy to pick. Like, should you start a startup or should you be like try to join some promising startup as an early employee? Um, and it's just really hard to make those decisions well if you're like really uncalibrated uh, in the probabilities and like expected payoffs. So it might give you some like additional boost in morale or motivation to like think you're 51% likely instead of 10% likely, but it comes at this huge cost of like messing up your decision calculus. So, cool, I'll thanks. stop. Sure. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. uh, two questions. First, in one of your slides you had when you were talking about climate change, a measure for curiosity. Yeah. Uh, I might have missed that, but just what is the metric or how did they define what curiosity actually was? Right. Yeah, I, I just skipped over that. Um, it was a mixture of things. Um, it wasn't just self-report, so it was like, uh, sorry, it wasn't just self-report in, in the sense of like, how scientifically cur curious are you? Um, it was self-report in some senses, so they would ask people like, how many like books about science have you read this year? How many like scientific lectures have you been to? Um, questions like that. Um, they also had a behavioral non-self-report metric that was like, um, I think they disguised it as a marketing survey or a survey about something else, where they like gave people a bunch of um, articles or articles they could read or like magazines to subscribe to or something. And then like, so people like didn't know this was actually a test of scientific curiosity and then like checked whether people were more likely to, to select the articles or the magazines that were about science instead of other things. Um, there might've been a couple more, but it's roughly that. Great, thank you. And then secondly, there seems to be, I think you kind of tiptoed around it, this tension between rationalism and maybe the prism of emotionality, um, specifically kind of how, I'm sure you've read it, but if you haven't, like Jonathan hates like mm -hmm. the righteous mind and kind of what context that looks like. Yeah. I was wondering if you could expand a little bit more about whether or not it is possible within certain scenarios, like you gave the survival scenario, right? Like mm -hmm. there is a context of sometimes like just the emotionality of that situation just overbears everyone in the context. So if that was the case, is there some sort of delta that 
in your kind of prisma or in your context of a cushion can be measured from going from soldier to scout uh, would be necessary to kind of reach that threshold. Like basically, is there is there a measurable point from going from soldier to scout uh, that mitigates kind of emotional response to a situation? To make sure I understand, are you asking whether um, the move from soldier to scout modes tends to or, or necessarily involves reduced emotion? I'm asking in every scenario when you're moving from soldier to scout, there's always going to be a variable of emotion, right? Like in certain situations, it's going to vary just on the degree of what that situation is. So if you mm -hmm. just survived a plane crash, you're probably going to be very emotional versus sitting down and, you know, just having dinner or trying to decide what dress or suit you should wear. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering, I guess, what degree you need to overcome that emotional variable in order to make that leap from soldier to scout? Yeah, I mean, I, I do think it's interesting. Um, so in some cases, uh, the in some cases, your ability to like think accurately and honestly about something require like emotions will just get in the way. Um, but in other cases, you kind of need a little bit more emotion. There's like this, this kind of ideal window of, of taking a question seriously, where like, I don't know, I was in a conversation recently about um, whether AIs could feel pain, um, or like at what point should we think that AIs can feel pain. And, uh, and most people's answers to this question were like pretty glib. Uh, like it didn't actually feel like they were thinking about the question seriously. Uh, and I think, and that's understandable, because I don't think we're pretty far from the point where like AIs could plausibly feel pain. So it's understandable they weren't taking the question seriously. Um, but but if you actually like think about what would it what would it mean if if these algorithms that we're you know iterating millions of times were like experiencing something that could reasonably be called suffering, that's that's like a terrifying scenario. <laughs> and I think I think. It does actually help to like really viscerally feel like, oh God, it ma this this matters. Like whether or not we get this right, there's a lot hanging in the balance here, and that can kind of like force you to like really try to get the right answer. Um, whereas otherwise, you might just be kind of like making clever shit up, uh, just sort of as like an intellectual exercise. So yeah. So what I'm saying now is the relationship between emotion and like really trying to get the right answer on a question is is not monotonic. Um, probably on average, like less emotion results in like more objective decision making, but not always. Um, and then, could you the, foresee a scenario where the opposite is true, where more emotion actually provides more uh, context or more oh, that, rationale? Well, sorry, that that was the thing I was yeah. trying to give okay. with the Perfect. with the AI pain example. Um, then the the last thing I'll say is, uh, I do think it's possible to experience strong emotions and just separate them from the decision, like, like, in the case we were talking about a few minutes ago where like the worst case scenario is like actually quite bad, um, I think it's possible to like immerse yourself in the worst case scenario in your mind and be like, wow, I, that, that would be so terrible. I like feel so sad at the idea of dying early or my friends dying or whatever the like t terrible stakes are um, and then still when you're like making decisions to maybe this actually isn't that different from what you were saying like you're asking about emotion in the decision making process I, what I'm tr what I was just trying to say there is I don't think being able to make like rational decisions requires you to not have emotion in your life in general <laughs> but like in the decision making process itself yeah that's different yeah, so uh, I believe uh, you spent a decent amount of time and energy um, uh, communicating these types of topics. Um, so this metaphor is probably similar to like Bayesian reasoning and some adjacent areas. I'm kind of curious, uh, if that's the case, I'm kind of curious um, how you evaluate the effectiveness of communicating these topics to your audience, as I'm sure you've experimented with a, a few different ways of, of explaining it, with you know Scout uh, and Soldier being one metaphor around kind yeah. of similar fundamental topics? Um, I don't know. I mean, this is something that I'm, I'm having to think about right now because of, I'm like picking titles for the book and like 
ways to frame it and so on. Um, and I, I feel pretty uncertain about what the best framing is. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I guess one thing that I have learned or that I've like come to believe during this whole process is that um, to try to avoid the word rationale, uh, sorry, rationality or rational, um, which seems a little, you know, my podcast is Rationally Speaking. <laughs> this organization I co-founded five years ago is the Center for Applied Rationality. Uh, the problem with that word, as I have like learned many times, is uh, a it like kind of makes people think that the that I like think I'm perfectly rational already, and so I'm like just trying to make other people rational like me. <laughs> um, whereas the actual the, the thinking behind it was more like there's a spectrum and it's possible to, to be more rational and like we're all sort of somewhere on the spectrum but like no one's perfectly rational and like it's like a, a vector, <laughs> it's like a directional goal. Um, but that's like a hard, interesting thing about communication is that you can tell people explicitly like X is not what I mean but often they'll still just like walk away thinking you mean X. Uh, and I don't know if that's because they just don't believe you when you say X isn't what you mean or if they're just like so anchored on the meaning that like it just like doesn't stick or something. So, so part of what I was hoping with Scout and Soldier, um, aside from just thinking it like works as a metaphor, what I was hoping from a communications strategy standpoint is that it would be like different enough that it like wouldn't cause people to, to go into the motions they always go into when you know debating rationality or irrationality. We'll see. Uh, so I agree. I think that you should ideally, a 10% and a 51 probability of success should have the same emotional reaction. Mm -hmm. But genetically, we're not predispositioned to do that, and neither mm -hmm. society. So if I am an entrepreneur, and if I tell people I have a 10% probability of success, give me money, I don't think anyone would. And I don't think Elon Musk did that, too. So what do you think is the way for society to change, and even generally for an individual to act in that circumstance where everyone is not, or everyone prefers being complete irrational belief is like really irresistible. Uh, yeah, a couple things. Um, one, well, I don't know exactly how Elon Musk pitched his startup, but I definitely don't think, from the founders and the investors that I've talked to, I definitely don't think you need to claim that you have like a 99% chance of success. And I, I think if you did explicitly claim that, for most investors, that would be like kind of a red flag that that just seems like really, you know, you're like, missing a lot of things or you're lying to yourself. Um, that said, you don't have to, like, you can present the positive vision for, like, here is what I'm trying to do, here is what I think we can achieve uh, without, you know, dwelling on all the ways it could fail. Uh, so I, this is, like, kind of analogous to what I was saying earlier about, like, you can have, like, enthusiasm and verve and, like, motivation um, without, uh, like, without have, that having to translate into a 99 or 100% probability of success. I think similarly when you're persuading other people, you can like lay out the exciting case um, without having to claim that it's 99% likely to succeed. Uh, I also think that there's, for, for more sophisticated audiences, more so than less sophisticated audiences, your credi credibility actually does go up when you like point out potential weaknesses or flaws in the plan. You just have to like, show that you've like understood them and like are aware of them and still like think this is like a good plan overall um, as opposed to like dwelling on the weaknesses in a way that like makes you look I don't know uh, at a loss or something like that. Um, all of that said like there's some situations where if people if people's expectations are like sufficiently high and unrealistic then you're just at a disadvantage if you try to be realistic like uh, if you um, I don't know, like in politics, for example, I would say like audiences are not that sophisticated just because it's, you know, the whole public, so like almost by definition, they're not that sophisticated. And so, you know, most people just like don't have the frame of reference to know what's a realistic thing to promise. Um, and if, you know, if you go out there as a politician and say like, okay, look, everyone else is telling you like we can like get all these great things without you know any any tax increases. That's just not realistic. Like here's the realistic thing. Like you are going to be at a disadvantage. 
Um, and you know, you have to like, you have to like make a choice there <laughs> about whether you, you know, if you're in a domain like that, like, personally, my opinion would be, it's still better to like retain an accurate model internally and then just like be willing to fudge the truth a little bit externally if that's literally how everyone else is playing the game. But that's like a strategic and ethical choice you'd have to make.